today what uh, we are going to cover mostly is about the review question and uh, uh, criteria for including studies in systematic review and some searching strategies which uh, are commonly used and maybe uh, we can extend this searching exercise to the next session also for partly but uh, if people are comfortable with uh, what we discuss we can uh, go beyond searching and in the next talk so today we are mainly focused on the question criteria for st including studies in your review and uh, some searching strategies so uh, before you start a review it is necessary to have a well formulated question and the reason is that it is the question which will decide what kinds of studies will be included in the systematic review so eligibility criteria for the inclusion of studies in the review depends on what the question is and we will discuss that in detail uh, in subsequent uh, slides the second is search strategy also derives terminology or terms search terms from the review question so sometimes people have a hierarchy of terms which are used for searching sometimes intervention is the one which you start with sometimes it is the patient characteristic which is uh, the starting searching term and rarely it is the outcome but more often than all of this is combining all these terms and getting the right kind of studies for your systematic review so if your question is not clear then searching strategy will also be effective. then the question about uh, collecting data when you are abstracting data from the included studies again you have to remember what is the review question accordingly you will formulate your data form and then extract uh, data from the included studies after you have extracted data from the studies you have to formulate or structure your synthesis or meta-analysis if there are two or more studies with data now when you are structuring your meta-analysis as you will see in one of the sessions when we show revman to you that it will ask you what is the outcome and then it will ask you what is the comparison so comparison is in uh, intervention in comparison will go there and outcome is something which you have to write in the formulation of synthesis or meta-analysis these things are to be filled up before you start entering data in the or conducting the meta-analysis of course once you have structured this then just entering the data automatically the software will go on doing meta-analysis and you will keep on watching how the results are changing but structure of the meta-analysis particularly outcome and interventions which are under comparison will be dependent on what is your review question as we will see the review question particularly in case of interventions has four important components patients intervention comparison and outcome pico as we call it and that is what is guiding several steps in the meta-analysis and also in presentation of findings now when you are selecting a question for review it may be good to remember finer we were discussing that last time also uh, finer as you may have gathered we were talking about it f stands for feasibility 
I stands for interesting. Is it interesting to you? N stands for novel. Something new should be there. E stands for ethical. And R stands for relevance. So you have to have a question which meets most of these criteria. Some criteria may be more important than others in your review question, but feasibility, interest, nobility, ethical and relevance are very important characteristics of a good question. So before you write your question in the PICO format, you have to ask these questions uh, to formulate or to arrive at something which will be your review question. What situation will not be feasible? For example, if you want to do a systematic review of all antiplatelets used in antithrombotic treatment of any type of atherosclerotic condition, you will have such a huge data set that I, I must say that you will find that it is not feasible to do it. It is possible to do it. But within the time frame in which you would like it to be completed, it will be perhaps very difficult. And uh, interest is, of course, very important. Unless it is interesting, you will be, uh, you know, uh, getting tired. And I know many of the people started with Big Bang, but because of lack of interest on the subject, they left in between and the meta-analysis, systematic review, could never be completed. If it is feasible and interesting, you have to also ask what is new in this. If somebody has already done this systematic review and meta-analysis, no point repeating it, it will not get published. I must tell you one example. We, uh, along with the, you can say, uh, world's one of the top group in McMaster University, we wrote a systematic review and meta-analysis and submitted to a good journal. And the editor said, oh, this is already published. And actually, before we uh, submitted the uh, finding, already somebody published this meta-analysis. Obviously, somebody was doing it. And the simple question was, what is new in this? Already people have published a meta-analysis, so there is nothing new in this. And we are uh, sorry, we can't publish your results. Now, that's not end of the story. In fact, two more studies came later on and we included those studies. And now we have completed meta-analysis of all the studies which are available, including two new ones. And we have resubmitted to another journal. We haven't heard from them, but just to let you know that there should be something new. If somebody has already done it, very difficult to publish systematic review meta-analysis because you will not have anything to add to this. Then the other question is about uh, uh, ethics. Now, most of the time, there is no ethical question as regards systematic review and meta-analysis. But sometimes it may be, like you must ask, if I do this systematic review and meta-analysis and we publish our results, will it disturb or will it cause some kind of inequity? For example, there are some treatments which are very expensive and can only be afforded by only very high socioeconomic groups and promoting through systematic review may in fact result in inequity as far as the use of that treatment is concerned. That inequity may be at the level of individuals, some can afford, some may not. This inequity may also be at the level of providers because by providing the expensive treatment to a small group of people, they are definitely losing an opportunity to use the same amount of funds to distribute the benefit to wider range of people. So there is some kind of ethical question sometimes. 
and relevance of course there should be clinical relevance to the whole uh, question or whole uh, let's say uh, review which you are going to perform one uh, element in this selection of question which is not part of final but i have learned by watching people do this is uh, criteria i add s to this final so it becomes finers that s is scientifically sound the reason i said so i added this is that i was abroad for some time and when i came back to my department of neurology in aims uh, the then director had persuaded every department to do some studies uh, using some kind of stem cells and uh, lo and behold since there are many conditions which are uh, looking for treatment there is no effective treatment one of them is muscular dystrophy as you know dusen muscular dystrophy is one of them now of course there is some treatment for it but uh, i'm talking about 2005 or 2004 when there was uh, practically no treatment and uh, therefore people had started doing stem cell treatment but when i went into details i was not part of the study then i was surprised that how people have not paid much attention to this they were taking out blood from or let's say bone marrow cells from the same individual suffering from muscular dystrophy and after processing it in stem cell facility they were injecting the same cells uh, cd34 positive cells through intravenous route to the same muscular dystrophy patients so i told them look here if this is a genetic disease and that genetic defect is shared by all the cells so even this cd34 cells which you are giving from the bone marrow will have the same genetic problem which uh, muscle cells are having and you will not be able to improve anything and that also you are giving intravenously which we are not even sure how much of this is going to reach the muscles and even if it, it reaches it won't be able to repair the genetic defect unless you somehow program these cells to uh, let's say correct the defect which is there and then you inject them. now when i raise this question uh then only people realize oh i see uh, i can see that it is a futile exercise so the whole uh, project was not scientifically sound that's why i have added s it doesn't come in feasibility it was feasible it was interesting to that person it is it was new it was ethical in a sense ethics committee had approved it it was clinically relevant not scientifically sound so when you are checking your review question this applies to other research questions also you can check about feasibility interest novelty ethicality and clinical relevance also whether it is scientifically sound or not so you have to know the background knowledge before you start writing your question then you can write your pico question and i have already said p stands for uh, type of patients you will take i for types of interventions you are talking about c for comparator and o for outcome works very well for a review which is meant for interventions but with slight modification it can fit with diagnostic prognostic and even uh, you can say uh, etiologic uh, or harm kind of studies so i will come to that later on but this you have to write in your protocol as we have said in the first uh, session that protocol is very important and that has to be written before you start conducting your study and then then this review pico will be the basis for, on which you will select the studies means you will declare a study as eligible or not eligible what will be included what will be excluded but there are other eco questions which are you can say embedded in a review 
which you have to enunciate at various stages. For example, I told you when each of the forest plots you, which you will make, you must have seen that one meta-analysis often has more than one forest plot. Usually it is for different outcomes. Sometimes it is for different comparisons. So for each synthesis or each forest plot, there is a PICO. If there are five forest plots, there are five PICOs in that systematic review and meta-analysis. Again, you have to plan it at the protocol stage, define the question, and also how you are going to do the synthesis, how you are going to do the synthesis, what will be the structure, which means what will be the comparisons and what will be the outcomes and whether you are going to do it in a patient subgroup. So that subgroup will also be identified. For each synthesis, you have to do this. And that is within the larger PICO of the review question. And then, of course, when you include the studies, then each study you have to look at and see what is the PICO of this study? What, what are the types of patients in this study? What is the intervention? What is the comparison? What is the outcome? Works very well. Our PICO works very well for intervention, but it works for other uh, situation as well. For example, you may sometimes write PICO as PECO rather than PICO, in which case, instead of I for intervention, you have E for exposure. Now, these variations are used somewhat loosely by different people, but it is a mnemonic to remember what are the things you have to keep in mind. And E stands for exposure in, ex in those conditions or situations where uh, an intervention may harm, you have to uh, characterize that as exposure. If you are going to do systematic review, whether uh, and how much is the damage to liver due to alcohol in patients who take uh, regular alcohol or the who's, uh, who are alcoholic, exposure is alcohol. It doesn't look nice to say exposure is intervention. It is not an intervention, it is an exposure. And uh, therefore, PECO fits much better. Now, sometimes uh, the same PICO, PICO, I may stand for index test. So in diagnostic studies, I becomes index test and you compare with gold standard and outcome is sensitivity, specificity and so on. In prognosis question, the prognostic factor is uh, the variable uh, which is like an exposure, but to fit it with PICO, I call it, called it in my book, uh, the second edition of the evidence-based uh, medicine book, I as indicator variable, indicating what? Indicating the prognosis of the patient. So P is for patient population, I is indicator, indicator variable, indicator for prognosis, C is comparison, which means perhaps indicator variable absent in those patients, and O is the outcome. But you can take a prognostic factor also as an exposure, uh, and then, of course, uh, can uh, work on the writing of your review question. Sometimes there is no comparator. So, for example, if uh, there, is, there are all patients are exposed to some treatment, Everybody is getting some treatment, but you want to see whether those who received, let's say, five days treatment are different from uh, those who received 10 days treatment. In this case, there will be a difference which you will compare in your meta-analysis, though all the patients are actually exposed. There is no unexposed group in this. And so I would say that you, you may just use PEO or PIO for your systematic review or meta-analysis. We can also think about uh, uh, age as a prognostic factor. And everybody has got some age, but you are going to compare older age with younger age uh, or vice versa, in which case age becomes a prognostic factor and you are going to compare uh, age as a exposure, uh, which is associated with some outcome. 
that will become PEO or PIO. It depends on what you are going to uh, look for in your systematic review. Sometimes people only look at outcome in a particular type of patient population. So patients who are diagnosed as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, for example, how long they survive. You may do a systematic review and meta-analysis of that. Or what is their three-year mortality rate, your mortality risk. You can do a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, just having type of patients and outcome as you are in your review question. So while PICO is a good way to uh, remember what components you have to write in your review question, it is uh, not essential that all four components will apply to your review. You may modify this depending on what is the focus of your review. Some people have modified it further and call it PCOT. And that T stands for uh, time, time uh, which is what is the time at which you are looking at. For example, I told you uh, whether at three years, people, what proportion of people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis survive, and uh, that may be the T in that. But sometimes it's not relevant. If you want to know what is the length of survival of patients with ALS, you are not going to write a particular T or time, but most of the outcomes, particularly related to mortality, it has inherent or implicit time as one of the determinant or time one of the dimension. It is not necessary that you always specify it. It is good if you are specifying it, but you just imagine if this time is 100 years, then you don't need to do any meta-analysis. We know that there will be 100% uh, mortality. Uh, nobody will survive beyond that. So there is always a T which is implicit, whether you write it or not, but some authors, they like to specify it. And some people have modified it as P cos, and S stands for study design. And some people say S stands for settings. So it all depends, you know, who is uh, uh, writing this variation. Some people will write S for study design, some people write S for setting. Is it you are doing in primary care, secondary care, tertiary care? Are you doing in, uh, for example, a developing country setting or you are going to do it in a developed country setting or what settings you are going to use? Are you going to take uh, only those studies which have been conducted in community uh, or you are going to also take those which are have been, have been done in hospital, for example? So that S may stand for setting, S may stand for study, uh, yes, study design, and the variation of this PICO will become PCOS. Now, one question which you will, I will always struggle is how broad, how broad should be the uh, you know, uh, scope of the review or how narrow it should be. I'm sorry, there is a spelling mistake here. Broad, uh, broad or narrow is something which you have to always think about. And I have certainly faced this uh, myself in many situations. For example, a broad review will be anti uh, what is the, uh, let's say, effects or what are the effects of antiplatelet agents in general in preventing all thrombotic events. I talked about this. So all patients who are at risk or who are having atherosclerotic disease or who are beyond the age of, let's say, 50 years, if you want to specify your population like this, whether antiplatelet agents given for primary prevention are effective in preventing thrombotic events. It will be a very broad question. But if you confine this to one antiplatelet like aspirin and confine this to only patients who have already had prior stroke or MI, then you are talking about secondary prevention and uh, you are only trying to assess what happens to incidence of stroke or myocardial infarction. So you, your uh, question is now uh, narrow. Now this question came up uh, to me when 
we were doing a systematic review which is published in the field of education we wanted to see whether assessment scores which are given in undergraduates have any uh, predictive ability of how these people fare in internship residency or clinical practice now we struggled a lot should we include practice practice where practice on the job practice in community practice in as uh, let's say a consultant and uh, in undergraduates also what do we mean are we going to look at all the scores of all the exams are we going to only look at professional exam scores and since this uh, scores vary from one country to the other are we going to include only those where standardized exam like nbme 1 and nbme 2 has been done and uh, this was our struggle when we were defining the question and to tell you the truth we wrote email to garden guide what do you think should we be focused on particular type of assessment in undergraduate particular type of practice say only residency or only internship or only practice what do you think and his reply was which i think clarified our doubt that why don't you start broad include everything in your question and then when you get all the studies then you can divide them and formulate smaller smaller picos for each analysis which you will perform so your broad pico will be then subdivided into narrower picos another instance i should tell you that uh, i wrote a protocol for anti anti convulsant drugs for status epilepticus when i sent this protocol i got two reviewers comment one reviewer said yeah yeah this is excellent it should be done and it is important this there was no systematic review meta analysis prior to our cochrane review which we had proposed another reviewer said oh god this gentleman or these uh, investigators or reviewers don't know abc of meta analysis how can they uh, do this type of systematic review and the main objection was that we had included all drugs which are used for status epilepticus uh, dizepam midazolam nat uh, uh, lorazepam uh, and many other drugs phenytoin phenobarbitone sodium valproate and we also said that all kinds of comparisons will compare with placebo will compare with uh, dizepam versus lorazepam we will compare dizepam versus phenytoin and so on so that is why very rightly the second reviewer said oh god they don't know abc of meta analysis they don't know that there should be focused pico focused question so patients we know patients with status epilepticus then also they have to define adults or children we had defined already we were talking only of adults and then they should also talk about one intervention and one comparison and of course outcome there was no problem in outcome but they didn't know that if we do this when i report reverse uh, center respond to response to this uh, reviewer i said if we follow this uh, of course this reviewer is right a systematic review or meta analysis should be focused there should be one intervention one comparison on particular type of patients with certain outcomes outcomes can be many there is no problem about that we will come to that later but if we do this then for if we can talk about one drug uh, one intervention one comparison we calculated by doing mathematics that there will be 64 systematic reviews which can be planned but how many randomized trials are there cochrane review used to include only randomized trials at that time only six or seven randomized trials were for this till then so how can we justify 64 reviews with only six uh, randomized trials or seven randomized trials so this is not the stage 
to split one uh, in, in uh, intervention, one outcome. At this stage, we should have a broad review and we will analyze each of these comparisons separately in separate forest plot. We will have perhaps three or four forest plot. There are not many studies. As the number of studies increases, there may be a time when people will split this review into different, different reviews. But at this time, it is not justifiable to do 64 Cochrane reviews with only six randomized control trials. So then our editor agreed with us and then allowed us to do this. And I think uh, it was a very uh, well received systematic review and meta analysis. So broad or narrow is something which you have to decide based on how much you know about the field, how much you can manage, and then always a broad question can allow you to split them into narrower questions. So remember, broad versus narrow is a very tricky thing. And uh, broad means more work, but it also allows you to compare you know, uh, how, what are the variables which affect the outcome. Uh, nowadays, people often do meta regression by looking at various variables, which are characteristics of the studies, and then what is influencing the outcome. So whenever you doubt, broader is better than narrower. But if you want to be focused, it is all right. If there are enough number of studies, it is justifiable to be uh, focused only on one intervention, one comparison, and uh, of course, a series set of outcomes. Now, what are the types of participants or types of patients? What are the factors which you look at when you are looking at criteria for eligibility of studies to include in your systematic review or meta analysis? And uh, Usually, uh, these are the things you, you ought to remember and you need to specify which disease or condition uh, and how defined. For example, we were doing uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of surgery in intracellular hemorrhage. And uh, in the initial stage, when there were only four systematic, four randomized trials, we had included definition which allowed even clinical diagnosis. But you know that later on, CT scan came, and no nobody will accept diagnosis without a CT scan. So in my first update, we changed the condition or disease definition. We said only CT diagnosed intracerebral hemorrhage. So you see, definition may change with time. What definition you are going to use, you have to justify uh, for uh, selecting studies in your systematic review. Demographics, which will be age and gender and sometimes other characteristics. Disease severity, uh, you have to say whether you are going to do, for example, we were doing TB meningitis review uh, and the question was, are you going to do stage one only or stage two only or stage one, stage two, stage three? Uh, we said all stages included. Uh, so similarly, you can talk about uh, cancer staging, so what disease severity you want to take, comorbidity, whether you are going to allow some comorbidities and not allow others, and what settings, primary care settings, secondary care settings, tertiary care settings, uh, community-based studies, hospital-based studies, hospital also you have to say which kinds of hospitals, so all these have to be included or specified in your protocol when you are writing criteria for selecting studies for the group. Defining interventions, I think you have to define exactly which what intervention you are talking about, who delivers it, how it is delivered, where it is delivered, when and how much is delivered, whether the intervention can be adapted or tailored. So what variations you are willing to accept. For example, in our TBM steroid meta-analysis, we had included oral as well as intravenous. We had included prednisolone, hydrocortisone, dexamethasone, all of this. So what all will be included in your uh, review has to be specified in intervention as well. And when you are talking about uh, types of interventions, you have to specify, as I said, uh, 
experimental as well as control intervention, uh, dose, intensity, we already talked about mode of delivery, how frequently it should be given, what should be duration and timing, whether you want to be broad or you want to narrow down to particular timing of your delivery. We'll studies uh, including intervention of interest combined with other interventions. So, for example, in our study, in our meta-analysis, since we were only talking about steroid versus no steroid, we didn't include comparison within steroids like prednisolone versus methylprednisolone or dexamethasone versus methylprednisolone, not in our review because that will be subject of another review if you are not including a very broad question. <laughs> Similarly, what comparator? Are you going to take only placebo control trials? Are you going to take no intervention or usual care, all of these have to be specified. And outcomes, outcomes are very important. And uh, irrespective of what outcomes the studies have included, you have to decide your own outcome. Because systematic review gives you an opportunity to focus on those outcomes which are, which have the potential for decision making. People may look at CSF's protein, may people may look at, uh, you know, colony count of uh, E. coli and so on. But the main question is, are they important for decision making or not? These are called critical outcomes. So when we move to GRADE, GRADE has uh, defined outcomes into critical outcomes, important but not critical and not important. So critical outcomes are those which are essential for decision making. And uh, those outcomes which are not important for decision making may have been included in the studies, but they should be excluded because they are not important for decision making. This is the recommendation currently of Cochrane reviews. When you are uh, doing it, you may have to, uh, you have the flexibility to include, uh, include outcomes, but you have must justify. Sometimes you may justify non-critical outcomes to support the critical outcomes results, which is okay, but you must justify. Also, must include both beneficial as well as uh, adverse effects in the outcomes. People often think only beneficial outcomes, that will not lead to uh, useful review for decision making, because decision making depends on combining or comparing or balancing benefits and harms. That's why you must have adverse effects as well as beneficial effects in your review outcome. Then comes the study design. And I think this is very crucial. You have to decide whether you are going to do, take only randomized control trials or you are going to also look at cross-sectional studies, case control study, cohort studies. And this is important because depending on that, you are going to select the studies. Cochrane initially had decided to include only randomized control trials because they were focusing only on intervention reviews. And uh, uh, any other study design was no, no in the beginning because I joined Cochrane collaboration in 1994, 1990, 1993 or 9, 1994. So 1993 was the first meeting in Oxford, then 1994, uh, I think uh, there it was in Hamilton and I was uh, in McMaster University. So that is when I joined that time other than randomized control trials were not to be included. Even now, most of the systematic review in Cochrane library have only randomized control trials. But now, increasingly, people are including other study designs as well. So you have to decide and you have to justify. Now, I must say that combining observational and randomized control trials is not completely no-no. It used to be no in Cochrane reviews. But it depends on whether uh, these observational studies as well as RCTs meet your criteria for PICO or not, and whether observational studies are not so much confounded that you will not like to include it, there is too much bias. So sometimes bias 
can be a reason why you will exclude a study. But if there is not much bias, then observational studies and randomized trials can be combined. combined. And uh, I must tell you that smoking uh, be before 2005, there were only observational studies. And people did meta-analysis of observational studies and showed that smoking kills people. Uh, if we only wanted to do uh, include randomized control trials, we won't have been able to ask people to stop smoking before 2005. So there is a reason and many, many situations are already empirically shown to, uh, to demonstrate that observational studies show the same effect as randomized control trials. It has been seen in treatment of hypertension. It has been seen uh, also in some other uh, conditions, but certainly in hypertension, we are sure. Uh, so there is no harm in doing meta-analysis, combining both observational and randomized trials. If they show different results, then you can examine what is the influence of study design on the effect size. So you can, if you don't include observational studies, you can't examine whether observational studies have different effect sizes compared to randomized control trials. But, but you have to satisfy the editor or let's say publisher of the protocol by giving good reasons why you want to include, include both observational and randomized trials. And Cochrane reviews uh, still they focus most of the time on randomized control trials. I think uh, <clears throat> this is one thing we, you ought to remember. Now, eligibility based on publication status and language is something which is uh, a matter which can be debated. Like, should you include only published studies or also unpublished studies? There is argument both for and against. Unpublished studies will obviously increase your precision because it will increase your sample size. It will certainly reduce publication bias because you are taking unpublished studies as well. But the problem is that how do you make sure that you have all the unpublished studies in your systematic review? You can't be sure. You can't go as asking everybody in the world whether you have any unpublished study on this topic. So <clears throat> whether your unpublished studies are representative sample of all the unpublished studies is not certain and can't be said. Secondly, quality of unpublished studies uh, is often questionable uh, unless you ask uh, the authors about each of the criteria and satisfy yourself that there is no undue bias in those studies. But of course, unpublished studies, if they have too much bias, you can exclude them after consideration. But in the initial phase, you can include them for, uh, uh, you can say, assessment of risk of bias. I think we will stop here because um, subsequently we have uh, slides for research, but I think we are already close to time. It will be good to have some question answer uh, and uh, we will take search only next time. Is that okay? Yeah, let's let's have some question answer. I think that is better. Then without peer review, can we take uh, article? Yes, we can take if there is there are unpublished studies. Uh, what uh, let's say what are the examples of reviews which have taken unpublished studies? There are many reviews, particularly related to statins, where people ask the drug companies to provide data if they have any unpublished study. And they got quite a good number of unpublished data. And uh, then they conducted systematic review and uh, have published it also, published in quite good journals. Unpublished studies, which are published in the abstract form, but not in full form, you can ask the authors to give you the data and if you are able to get the data and also methodology, then you can assess the risk of bias. And if bias is not a big problem, you can include that in your systematic review. 
Now, what if you are in doubt? If you are in doubt, then what you do is you do sensitivity analysis. What happens if you include these studies? What are the results? If you don't include these studies, what are the results? If results are no different, then nobody is going to question it. Your confidence interval will be narrower and you would have asked methodology from the authors and assure the readers that there is not too much bias. Any other question? One more question, sir. Uh, uh, sir, why Indian uh, journal is not taking, only one journal is taking protocol, that is systematic review journal. Other journal is not taking. What is the reason? Because recently I talked to one of the editor in chief. Then he said, Yar, koi bhejita hi nahi hai mere paas. Amole, sir, see why China is starting taking this all protocol, uh, still India is not taking that. So what will be the reason? You are editor in chief since six years. Yes, sir, that's still you are not promoting. So he may be he may be right. People are not sending protocols. That's why they are not getting published. But uh, but it all depends on the editorial board and editorial policy. So uh, if you uh, want to uh, publish protocol, there are some journals uh, willing to accept it very easily at least to consider it if your quality is good they will publish particularly open journals like bmj open but uh, i must tell you that uh, cochrane reviews they all publish protocol first before they allow you to start working on the review they want that protocol should be published so that is not a problem if you are doing a cochrane review so join a cochrane group and do cochrane reviews all protocols will be published but you can send to journals and some journals will publish, some journals will not. Many journals are publishing these days. We'll try, sir. I Thank have you. a question, sir. Um, yes, please. Can we take a cross-sectional and cohort study together for a meta-analysis? Uh, as I said, it depends on the question, but if you have a good reason to uh, include at least uh, in the beginning, both kinds of studies you can include. But first thing you will do is you will analyze cross-sectional in one forest plot, uh, then cohort study in another uh, uh, forest plot. Look at the results. If the results are same, means at least the point estimates are same, then I think you can do another forest plot or meta-analysis including all of this. So as I said that uh, it allows you to see whether study design affects the outcome or not. It has been seen already but uh, in your question one doesn't know so you can do this and uh, if there is no difference you can include all the studies together in one forest plot but if there are differences then better to keep them separate and discuss what are the possible reasons for differences. Thank you. Sir, <coughs> sir, uh, I have a question. Can we compare two studies in which one study has given the data in the form of continuous form and one mm -hmm. study has given uh, uh, in the form of cutoff? For example, uh, one study has given uh, uh, some value of say serum creatinine continuous one patient was have uh, one study had the mean serum creatinine like this other study was mm -hmm. having like this and in uh, other study it is in the form of cutoff how many patients had less than two how many had more than two can we compare such studies is it possible statistically yes yes yeah what you can do is yeah you can take cutoff for even the that study which gives serum creatinine in a continuous form if it gives you standard deviation and mean you can practically create the graph you know so then you can take a cutoff wherever you want to take a cutoff so you have to do some uh, you know uh, data extraction and use some softwares which are there uh, to get cutoff values and outcome according to the cutoff value in uh, your uh, continuous outcome study 
and then you can combine that with the study which gives you cutoff value. So uh, there are some softwares. Suppose somebody has given a graph, but not given you numbers. You want to get numbers from the graph. So there are softwares which can do it for you. Convert the graph into numbers. Okay. So, so there are there are uh, many things which are coming because of meta analysis. It wasn't there ten years, fifteen years ago, but now there are many softwares which will convert graph into your Excel sheet with all the numbers. Okay, thank you. Sir. And vice versa. Without individual data, how can you get that? Because most of the study, I also got same problem that. Uh, yes or no, creatinine more than 3.5, yes, less than 3.5 without individual data, how can we do sir? No, the continuous can be broken into continuous data, you can take cutoff at 3.5 because you can create the whole graph. If it is normally distributed, you can create the graph just by mean and standard deviation and take a cutoff wherever you want to take a cutoff. Cutoff to continuous is difficult unless a graph is provided. Graph can uh, can always be uh, broken down uh, and means there are softwares which will convert the graph into numbers. But the graph is not provided, then you are stuck up. You have to take cutoff on the continuous and then combine with the cutoff uh, giving study. Good evening, sir. Yes. Sir, I wanted to. Yes, sir, I ahead. wanted to ask if you are looking at where characteristic of some studies, like some genetic uh, research done on stroke, and we are trying to perform a systematic review on the lacuna of the papers. Sir, these hmm. are qualitative studies, and we cannot give a forest plot for that, sir. So, sir, how yes, do we yes. synthesize our results by analyzing this case, and how do we improve the quality of our paper? Ah, well, uh, you can qualitative studies also now are uh, being synthesized and uh, there are many papers also written, research synthesis without meta-analysis. So I will send you some of those papers you can read and summarize. Uh, there are two things. One is you can do synthesis without meta-analysis which is uh, now being standardized also in some way or the other. The other thing is how to synthesize qualitative studies. Qualitative studies are based on focus interview, uh, focused interview or focus group discussion, in-depth interview and so on. They are just, you can say, verbal uh, data in the form of transcribed interviews or focus group discussion and then when you have now, of course, softwares also, which can help you to identify themes, categorize them, and then the analysis will be not like meta-analysis, quantitative, but you will count how which themes have been repeated, how many times, and what can you conclude in the form of a paragraph. So there is, there is systematic review method of qualitative studies also. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Hello. Hello, sir. I have a question. Yes. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, like yesterday, you suggested one article about non inferiority trial that was published in NEGM in 2017 by Mori. Would you like yes. to suggest some article we can go through for today's talk, sir? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Uh, you see, there is a, a review handbook, which is, I think it must be available if you are going to uh, do or use Revman, it is part of the Revman also. So in review and Cochrane review handbook, it's all written, whatever I am talking about, it is all from my Cochrane experience and reading Cochrane handbook repeatedly that I have gathered all these points, so you can get it there. Uh, the other sources are, there are many books which are uh, on meta-analysis. 
and there are many papers also but uh, now this field has become so much grown up and complex that one paper cannot summarize everything but if you just want to know a bird's eye view then there are papers which you can find in many journals but if you uh, if you really want uh, a very quick uh, recap then uh, i i hate to say that uh, my publisher will kill me you can download my book there is some pdf circulating and available free and there is there are two chapters on meta analysis that will be one of the chapter will be enough to give you bird's eye view thank you sir thank you hello sir i have two small questions yes sir uh, can we include our own study uh, in the meta analysis or the systematic review yes why not uh, you you you, uh, you have no justification to exclude your own study Okay, okay. In, Second, fact, I... in fact, you see, what happens if you really progress in your research, what happens is you do a randomized trial. Uh, before randomized trial, you may have to do a meta-analysis. After you have completed your randomized trial, you redo the meta-analysis, including your own study. And uh, somebody else may also have published a similar trial by the time you have completed your study. So your meta-analysis will become much stronger when you do the second time, including your study as well as somebody else's study. So I, I think in one of my talk, I have shown research cycle. You write a proposal while writing, do a systematic review, then conduct a study, randomized trial or whatever. Then you again combine it and make a systematic review meta-analysis, identify gaps, there will be another study, so it goes on and on. It becomes like a cycle. Okay, sir. And my second question yes. is, uh, sir. And if I, I think I think you should do it. In fact, if you have done a randomized trial, you should do. If you have not done it earlier, you must do a systematic review, uh, including your own study. Why not? Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Sir, my next question is, uh, uh, in my meta analysis and systematic review, the, my outcome measure is continuous one. And uh, I have the five study, five randomized, uh, five RCTs which are eligible for the uh, my meta analysis. And in the mm -hmm. three of the studies, a good statistics is used. Say, for example, if the data is normally distributed, it is expressed in the mean mm -hmm. LD. And in the other mm -hmm. two studies, the very bad kind of statistics has used. So, if we mm -hmm. include the five studies in in the uh, single meta analysis. So, what uh, is there any chance of any problem? In, uh, no problem. We'll come to that. We'll come to. We have not got to the point of data analysis. So, okay. uh, I think uh, we in maybe not the next, but next to next one, we will start talking about analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we will meet again next week right thanks a lot thanks thank you for attending thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank, thank you sir, sir.